Today we're gonna make pesto, and I love a traditional pesto, but today we're going to make it a little bit different. I'm gonna use it as an opportunity to sneak in vegetables, specifically Popeye's favorite vegetable, spinach. He got me to eat spinach as a kid, and now pesto is gonna get us to eat more spinach. We're gonna use a little bit of guanciale and guanciale fat to make it. But before we do that, we need to make our homemade orchetti. So let's just jump right into it. Now we're going back to my go-to and favorite dough, Evan Funky semolina pasta dough, which is 454 grams or about a pound of durum wheat semolina flour and 225 grams or about eight ounces of nice warm water. And you use that container to just make a nice big well of flour on a cutting board and then into that well we'll pour that water. I'm gonna need a fork and a bench scraper for this. And with that fork, I'm just gonna start to whisk that water, slowly pulling in a little bit of that flour at a time. We're just gonna keep doing that for a minute or two, gradually incorporate the flour into the water to form what looks almost like a pancake batter in the center of the well. Once that becomes thick enough that the water won't run all over the board, then you can use that bench scraper and begin to cut flour into the water. You're gonna to start to hydrate the granules of flour and eventually it'll be hydrated enough that when you squeeze it together and compress it, it'll start to form a ball. And once you get to that stage, you can just start to knead it, work it, tear it, pull it back together until a nice ball forms. And then we can start to knead it for about five to 10 minutes. This is gonna create some gluten. It's gonna create structure in the dough. And after about five minutes of just working it, it's going to be kind of a shaggy dough. It's not gonna look smooth. It's not the final time we're gonna knead it. Kneading forms gluten, but resting also forms gluten. So we're gonna throw it into some plastic plastic wrap and we're going to allow it to rest on the bench for about 15 minutes and when we come back in 15 minutes it's going to be much softer much more hydrated and much easier to knead so we're just going to knead it for about another five minutes we're going to create a nice shape to the dough if your dominant hand's right you would use your right hand to push down on the dough and your left to turn it and you would repeat it sort of trying to fold air into the dough if your wrists hurt like mine you can use two hands doing the same technique And once that ball is nice and smooth, we're gonna get it back into plastic wrap and we're gonna let it sit for two to three hours before we use it or in the refrigerator overnight, which is what we did here. And then a day later, we're gonna get the dough out of the refrigerator and then we can start to make the orchetti. We're gonna slice about a fifth of the dough, wrap up the rest of the dough so it doesn't dry out. And then we're just going to start to roll this into a very long sort of snake of dough. The thickness that you roll that dough out to is gonna help sort of determine the final shape and size of the orichetti. And orichetti are fairly small. So you don't wanna go too thick. You're gonna to create too big of an orichetti. That would be an orechi, the big brother to orichetti. It can get long, so I just like to twist it up like this just to save some space. And you wanna cut about a thumbnail sized piece. And just with a basic knife, you're gonna push down on the knife with even pressure using two fingers and roll the knife towards you. This is gonna flatten the dough, it's gonna stretch the dough, and it's gonna create a rough texture inside the dough. It's gonna allow sauce to stick to it. It's gonna curl onto itself, so once it's on the knife, you're gonna fold it over your thumb to reveal the orichetti, or what that translates to, which is little ears. Then you wanna place them on a wire rack, you want them to dry out slightly. That's gonna help them hold their shape. And then once you have the orichetti technique down, which may take a few tries, then you're just gonna sit there, zen out, throw some music on, and maybe channel that Pugliese grandma in you to become an orichetti master by the end of making these. If you make all that dough, you're gonna get pretty good practice at it, so I bet you you're gonna be pretty good. I was horrible at this the first time I made it, but by the end of that batch of dough, you will see rapid progress, and your friends and your family are gonna love you for it. Store any unused dough in the fridge. Now, if you follow me for long enough, you know I never used to use plates before on this channel, believe it or not, but I have started using plates recently thanks to our friends and sponsor today, Made In. Made In designs professional quality products for the home cook, and they partner with multi-generation factories and artisans to offer you a comprehensive collection of pots, pans, serveware, and everything else you might need to cook and serve food in a home kitchen. And today we're talking about their plateware. Made In's plateware is made in England from the finest clay in the world, and they're crafted from a high alumina vitrified china. They're both modern and look like a retro grandma plate, and that's exactly my style. I've got a set of flat plates, which are great to have on hand for all general plating purposes. And I've also got what's known as coops, which is a hybrid of a plate and a bowl, which is great for certain pastas that you want to contain the sauces from, or if you're looking to cradle a big salad. Their plates are fully glazed, which means you can stack each piece without having to worry about the plates scratching each other. They come in four styles, 
styles, undecorated, a red rim, a black rim, and my personal favorite and go-to, the navy. And you know I'm not gonna talk about Maiden without saving you a little bit of money, so if you wanna get some of my favorite plates, cookware, and more, you're gonna get 10% off when you click the link down in the description. So go check out Maiden and let's get back into the recipe. Now in a lot of my Roman pasta recipes that would historically call for guanciale, I've used pancetta on this channel for the singular reason that in America for a while and in most places you cannot find a good quality guanciale. But lately I have been able to at some specialty Italian markets that I go to. And if you do find yourself some good quality guanciale from Italy, the flavor will take the carbonara, the alla grisha, the amatrashana to another level. That is a flavor that just reminds you of being in Italy. So we're gonna use this to add a little bit of meat, a little bit of texture, and that pork fat to flavor the, the pesto. So we're gonna chop this up, and then we're gonna toast a little bit of pine nuts and get this browned up and the fat rendered. First thing we're gonna do is remove this peppered skin on the guanciale that it's aged in. And once that's nice and cleaned, we're just gonna cut these like quarter inch thick planks and then into little lardones or strips. You could cut them as fine as you want. I just like a little bit of texture in there so they don't get lost. Then in a pan on medium heat, we're gonna add the pine nuts and we're just gonna toast those until they brown and release some of their oils. At the same time, we're gonna get a pot of water boiling. You wanna keep those pine nuts moving and make sure they don't burn. And once they're nice and browned, they smell nutty and you can see a little bit of their oils releasing in the pan, get them out of the pan and reserve them for later. Then go directly into that pan with the guanciale. And we just wanna cook the guanciale until the fat is fully rendered, which we're gonna use for the pesto. And the guanciale meat is nicely browned. Just like bacon, when it starts to foam, you're close to being perfectly browned. And once the fat is fully rendered and the meat is crisp but not brown, Riddle. You want to get the fat and the meat out of the pan and you just want to drain that fat into a bowl and reserve the meat for the garnish. Now that the water is boiling, we're going to get an ice bath. We're going to salt the ice bath and we're going to salt the water and then we're going to blanch the spinach. Get it in there, push it down, submerge it in the water and we're going to cook it for about 20 to 30 seconds max and get it out of the water into the ice bath. And the ice bath is meant to stop and shock the cooking process so that it doesn't overcook and we get that nice bright green color. But we don't want it to sit in that ice bath too long. As soon as it's cooled, we want to get it out, strain it out and wring out any of that excess moisture. And then we can make the pesto. In a blender, we're going to go in with the guanciale fat. Then I'm going to grate in a big fat clove of garlic. If you're using smaller garlic, you can use two. Then in with the spinach. And I've got some fresh basil from my garden. I'm going to add some of that. I think adding the basil just kind of creates a nice base flavor of the pesto. For pesto, you need some sort of herb. So we're going to stick with the basil. Get that into the blender. And then we're going to take the pine nuts. We're going to add about a third of a cup. We're going to reserve some for garnish. We want a little bit of crunch from the pine nuts at the end. And then we have a blend of 50-50 Pecorino cheese and Parmigiano Reggiano. I like both. You get the salty from the Pecorino and that nuttiness and that classic pesto flavor from the Parmigiano. We're going to add about three quarters of a cup of that. And then we're going to go in with two ice cubes. It's going to keep everything nice and cold so it doesn't oxidize and brown. And then we're going to season with a little bit of salt. We're gonna get that blending on high and then we're gonna start to stream in olive oil until that pesto loosens up and forms a nice thick paste. The longer you blend it, the creamier it should be. Make sure you just wipe down the sides so it gets fully incorporated. And then I like to add a little bit of lemon juice just to bring some brightness to it. Let it blend until it's nice and creamy and then into a bowl and you got a beautiful, creamy, flavorful pesto. And we can set that off to the side and we can start to throw this all together. In the boiling water that we blanched the spinach, we're going to go in with our orchetti and cook those for about two to three minutes until they start to float. And in that pan, we cooked everything else. I just wiped it out and I'm gonna keep that off the heat. We don't wanna apply any heat to the pesto at all. Add some of that pesto to that pan or a separate bowl if you'd like. Once the orchetti's cooked, we're gonna go straight into the pesto in that cool pan along with some pasta water. And I'm just gonna use the pasta water to thin out that pesto. The starchiness in it is going to make it sort of a creamy, beautiful, pasta sauce and once i've adjusted that sauce to the correct consistency to serve it with pasta using only a little pasta water at a time because we have no heat on so we can't reduce it if we need to so a little bit of water at a time then i'm going to taste it adjust any seasoning i think it needs a little bit more lemon juice so i'm going to add a squeeze more lemon juice and then we can plate 
And look how beautiful that color is. And in one of those made in hybrid plate bowls, we're gonna add the pesto. And then I'm gonna take a little bit more pasta water. I'm gonna thin out what's in the pan to create a more flowy sauce that I'm gonna pour right on top. So we get a nice saucy pasta. And then on top, we're gonna go in with some guanciale and some pine nuts for texture. And then we're gonna finish it with a little bit of that Parmigiano Reggiano and Pecorino cheese mix. And then you have it. It's just as good of a pesto. I think with the guanciale fat, it's a little bit better. It's a little bit more satisfying to me. It's gonna be something you're gonna make for the rest of the summer. This right here, this is beautiful. You still get a, a nice base of that basil pesto, but on top with that addition of the spinach and the guanciale. It's just a nice switch up. The flavors go well together. It doesn't taste too healthy, but there's a lot of greens in here, which you can feel good about. Want the recipe? Link's gonna be down in the description. That's all that I have today. I'll see you next time. Until then, take care of yourself and go feed yourself.